We're going to consider now how to design a beam with point loads applied considering bearing resistance. So on your screen you'll see a beam and then this has different loads applied. You've got an end load there and then an internal load applied and these get applied over some distance n and some distance n there and we need to know is this um, uh, beam strong enough and point loads can be applied by all sorts of things. You may have a piece of equipment sitting here the, the, applying the load P. You may have a silo that's sitting on a beam. You could have a column coming down from the floor above. You could have lots of things. You could even have um, in a connection you may have a stiffness. Um, well, you may have point loads from other parts of the structure bearing against it or rotating. Or, uh, so there's, there's many cases where you will need to design for a point load as at a column. For instance, as I was saying, so if you've got a beam that's welded on and it goes into bending, this effectively puts a point load there and then a tension load there. And so you'd have a point load that you would need to design for. So let's start having a look at what failure mechanisms we can experience. Well, there are three main ones. Yielding of web, crippling of web, and web buckling. So this is when the yield stress is exceeded. So at a distance down, the yield stress at that position exceeded. Web crippling is then when there's a localized failure, um, a local buckle of the web. And then you get web buckling, where the entire web um, buckles out. So yielding, crippling, and buckling. And uh, we've got equations to describe each of these. Firstly, maximum slenderness. The slenderness ratio of a web shall not exceed that. 8,300 divided by the yield stress. And so this slenderness, HW over TW, um, so HW is from the inside of the radius. In section classification, it's not, but for um, shear design, it is. It's the inside of the radius. HW divided by TW shall not exceed 8,300 divided by yield. Um, and so that prevents buckling. That prevents this overall web buckling. So that is why you do that, that check of HW over TW. Now, uh, the rest of the calculations are the other two failures. So the factored resistance of the web BR shall be taken as followed. For interior loads, concentrated load applied at a distance from the member and greater than the member depth shall, shall be the smaller of. So a bearing resistance and then a bearing resistance. So this is buckling and uh, bearing. Well, uh, web bearing and web um, crippling resistance. Now, one way you can understand these equations is that if you have a look at this bearing resistance, n is a distance and 10 times tf are distances. So those are distance. You multiply it by a thickness and you have an area. So n plus 2 plus 10 tf is an area. Um, well, when it's multiplied by Tw, so it's an area times yield stress gives you a force and then a partial factor. So this is just taking a physical area and uh, it is this area here so the load distributes out the load is applied it distributes through the flanges and then through a bit of the web um, and then you design it at that section so you're just checking the stresses along this line where it spreads out 5 tf each side 5 times the thickness of the flange each side we're checking the stresses here are not going to be exceeded. The same thing with an end load, it just ex um, spreads out only in one direction. We're checking the stress there, so it spreads out four times the thickness of the flange away from, from that side. And an end load is it's when it, within this end zone, um, less than h away from the end, and uh, then it's an end load. And so that gives you your bearing resistance here bearing resistance and then so this is for an interior load and uh, end load end reactions is here so uh, then we have a um, crippling resistance and offhand this may look a little funny when you first see it 
These, the form of this equation is a typical buckling type equation. It takes into account the yield stress, the Young's modulus, and it's the square root of both those times the thickness of web squared. And one thing you'll see is you don't see a, a length appear here. It is purely based upon the thickness of the web um, that experiences this buckling. So 1.45 times 5bi um, times thickness of web squared times square root of Fy over Fe. And either of these could govern. Either it could cripple or it could yield. Because first you check web buckling and then you say yes, does it classify with that or not. Then you check is either of these possible. And so you would go through the, the calculations, run through that, get the end reactions. Um, and then yeah, check either for for bearing or crippling, and there you go. And so n is the length of bearing, and just be careful, this is a mistake. That shouldn't be there, that 2, the, it is a length, and then there's your partial factors, and that's also a mistake. That should be a comma, not a um, semi-comma. Uh, there you go. Um, so that's 0.75 and 0.8, wherever the bearing resistance of the web is exceeded. So what happens now, though, if we load it, and the load is exceeded. Let's say now we've got a big chunky silo, it sits here, it puts a point load on our beam and our beam is not strong enough, or a machine. We often would have big industrial machines, put them on beams and always we put on a, a then stiffener below the beam. And to be honest, just as a side note, um, if you've got a beam and you have a point load on top, if it's any piece of machinery or anything, if it's not, if you're not 100% sure it's going to be exactly in the middle, just put in a, a web stiffener because um, often that load is not exactly where you think it is. The piece of machine didn't fit, so they just move it across, and suddenly you have an eccentric load that can bend the flange. So rather just put in stiffeners under any high point loads. Even if the calc say you may not need it, it just gives you a little bit of flexibility. Um, so now let's get on to bearing stiffeners if the load cannot be carried. And in this paragraph here, it describes the design equations. Now, I'm not going to specifically go through this entire um, paragraph. There are just a couple of main points that I would like to um, come to. Firstly, how do we design a web stiffener? All you need to think about is column. Think design of column and what is the shape of my column. Either an interior stiffener is simply a part of the web plus um, two stiffeners and it's 25 times the thickness of web. If it's an end one, it's 12 times the thickness of web. So uh, we just take the area of the web, we um, 25 times or 12 times, we add on the stiffener area, and suddenly we have got a column. And so we can now design this um, column to carry the bearing uh, loads on top of it. So we have to be a little careful, because there's a couple of checks we've got to do, but ultimately you're designing a column. Now firstly, let's think about this column and how will it buckle? Let's think about the different buckling modes. Can it buckle that way? Yes, it can buckle from side to side. The entire section may experience a sideways buckle as the load is applied and the, the section buckles sideways. But what about left to right? Can it buckle down the length? Well, if it tries to move sideways, there's actually a lateral restraint that edge, and there's a lateral restraint that edge. There's the rest of the web prevents movement. So you don't really need to design for that. And once again, will it experience torsion? Will it twist? Will you have a torsional buckling stress? Well, once again, you've got restraint there, and you've got restraint there. So unless you have very, very slender webs, uh, which is typically outside of most plate girders and the likes, you only need to design for buckling about one axis. You don't need to do torsion. You don't need to do um, you know, uh, weak axis buckling. So you just check buckling about X, you get your resistance. Well, it could be either weak or strong, depending on the, the geometry of the section, but you only check a buckling about X, and that is sufficient. So... Uh, that is then for a compressive resistance, as in the entire section um, uh, kind of design it for buckling. But then also you've got to check a bearing resistance. It's the same as above, except now we only use that area there. We exclude the radius. Exclude radius or radii. Um, so there's two of them for bearing. So when you 
calculate a bearing resistance, you have a BE value, a bearing width. So it's minus off the chamfer, and normally use BE equals BV minus R, where that is the radius of the, the curve there. But that's typically what they would make that um, to. So ultimately, if you go back into this equation, I mean, this paragraph, this paragraph will tell you all of that I've just told you, plus a bit more, but um, it, it's just a summary I've shown you because you don't immediately pick it up. Firstly, there's the 25 times its thickness at stiffness or 12 times its thickness um, at the end. You've got to get it KL over R value for buckling. It's three-fourths of the length. This is something I forgot to mention. Um, when you have your buckling length, when you design your column, so if that's your L, when you design it, you design it as being two-thirds the length. KL equals, well, K, uh, KL equals 0.75L. You use 75% of the overall length um, for the, the design. So just be careful of that. You don't use the full height because the end flanges do provide some restraint. So use three-fourths of the length in terms of your design. And yes, that summar um, summarizes the design of, of bearing stiffeners. Here are a bunch. So this is a um, big steel structure. And what you have is on this, this was carrying a bunch of silos. So you had massive loads coming down at these various positions, very high um, point loads. And so below them, you'll see you've got, uh, well, th this was just for a, a web stiffener, but you've got bearing stiffeners below these point loads. So that's a bearing stiffener, bearing stiffener, bearing stiffener. So wherever you have high point loads, there was a bearing stiffener, and then also the webs were, were stiffened. This is a two meter deep plate girder, just to put in this perspective. This was, these are very, very big beams with plenty of bolts down the end to carry all the load, and then uh, big point loads from, from various industrial equipment and silos. And you would design these exactly as the way um, we've shown you above in terms of checking the bearing resistance and checking um, the buckling resistance. First you would check it without stiffness and you oops it's not going to work and you add stiffness and then you get these results. The final comment to be made with stiffener design or bearing design as well is what force do you use because this is another place where people often make mistakes. For instance here I've got my beam and I've got my silo, my piece of equipment sitting here applying a point load P and if I draw the bending, I mean the shear force diagram I end up with something like this and uh, so there it is and then I've got a value of P over 2 each side. Now People commonly said, all right, they take the shear force diagram and then they design for a value of P over 2. Remember, that is the shear force, not the bearing force. When we design for bearing, we are looking at what's immediately happening below it. So you design for the full force P. This is the shear force that you would design for, so that is VR. This is your BR, your bearing resistance. So just be very careful of that. Uh, when it comes to design. Otherwise, hope this has helped.